Welcome to this uh, policy exchange event. My name is Benjamin Barnard and I'm Head of Technology Policy here at Policy Exchange. And today we're going to discuss levelling up the digital economy. How can we ensure a digital-led recovery post-COVID-19? Um, the UK tech sector is, in my opinion, and that of many others, powering a new era of growth. And I think that this is one of the really exciting events that we have at Conservative Party Conference, where we can bring some of the voices of those who are leading the kind of digital transformation of our economy and our society um, and bring them right into the policy discussion. So without further ado, let me introduce our fantastic panel today. We're incredibly honoured to be joined by Chris Philp MP, who is the recently minted Permanent Undersecretary of State at the Department of Digital, Culture, Media and Sport. I believe that this is one of the first times he's addressed his new portfolio. Um, and I can't actually think of a better place to do so than here at Policy Exchange. It's a great pleasure to have him here on the panel. We also have um, Katie O'Donovan, who's the Public Policy Manager of Google UK. Um, she's responsible for Google's Brexit policy, young people's online behaviour, and prior to working at Google, she developed a range of experience working on everything from Tony Blair's policy unit uh, right the way through to the research and innovation unit in number 10. So it's a uh, fantastic to have her on the panel. And likewise, we're also joined by our senior fellow, Chris Brannigan, who is a special advisor to both Theresa May and to Boris Johnson. And hopefully joining us from Zoom, who you should be able to see, um, is James Wise of Boulders and Capital. Uh, Bolton is one of the UK's leading venture capital funds, and uh, um, he's unfortunately not able to join us in person, but we're incredibly honoured uh, to have him on the panel nonetheless. So without further ado, I thought I'd turn to Chris and say, when you're incoming, you're looking at it with a fresh pair of eyes. How do you see the UK digital landscape? What can we do to better regulate tech, to encourage investment in the UK, and to tackle some of the sort of skill shortages that mm. we're experiencing in what I think is the most productive area of the economy. Mm. Wonderful. Well, look, thank you very much indeed for that, uh, for that introduction, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, as you say, I am the newly minted uh, Minister for Technology and Digital Economy, uh, and when the Prime Minister uh, asked me to do this just a couple of weeks ago, I was delighted. Well, I say he asked me to do this. You don't really get asked, you get told. Uh, so I, 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 I was delighted to follow his, uh, follow his instruction, and um, particularly because before being elected to Parliament about six years ago, I set up and ran a series of companies, the first of which um, was a technology-enabled business that we eventually uh, set up from scratch, got two rounds of VC funding, floated on AIM, and it subsequently got taken over by a business called Booker and then by Tesco. So this whole journey from start-up to IPO uh, to becoming part of a big company uh, is a journey that I've been on personally, and it's a journey that I want to help as many of our fellow citizens make as possible as we embrace the possibilities presented by the digital um, economy. Uh, I feel that we are, as a nation, standing on the cusp of a second digital revolution, which is really uh, the fourth in a series of revolutions that we've had economically. Thankfully, no actual revolutions. Jeremy Corbyn lost the election, so there are no real revolutions, but economic revolutions. Uh, we obviously had an agricultural revolution uh, two or three centuries ago, followed by an industrial revolution in the 19th century, followed by the first digital revolution in the latter half of the last century when computing and then the internet took off. And I think we're now standing on the cusp of a second digital revolution that will be powered by quantum computing, by artificial intelligence and by the cloud, all of which uh, are enormously um, exciting. Uh, when I was studying physics um, at Oxford uh, 25 years ago, we were talking about quantum computing. Uh, I think it's now actually beginning to happen in a practical way. So I'm enormously excited by the possibilities these uh, rapidly evolving technologies present. Um, but I'm, I'm surprised and slightly sorry to say uh, our Labour opponents do not always share our enthusiasm for the possibilities being presented. Uh, I was with a panelist, who I won't name, uh, in a previous um, presentation, who said they, were, they had the misfortune to be at the Labour Party conference last week, uh, a, a traumatising <coughs> experience from which I imagine they're only just recovering. And they said that when they talked about these digital opportunities in the Labour Party conference, um, Labour MPs and delegates were, were talking them down and saying... They thought that it could threaten jobs, that it could create um, digital inequality and all this kind of stuff. And they were effectively proposing a levelling down, the opposite to what we're proposing. Um, and, you know, as with so many other areas of Labour's instinctive response, like education, for example, where they want to push everybody down to the lowest common denominator, they seem to want to do that in the digital sphere as well. And the first thing I wanted to say is that the, the socialist, the Labour approach or attitude towards these issues 
is completely wrong. First, obviously, first of all, uh, in relation to jobs, um, there is going to be a transition in our economy where AI and other technologies um, effectively replace some jobs that were done uh, previously by large numbers of people. But we have seen transitions like this in the past. 300 years ago, about 98% of the population worked in agriculture. Today, it's only 1%. We've successfully made this huge transition from an agricultural economy uh, to an industrial economy, and now principally to a service-led economy. These transitions are a natural part of a country's economic development, and the same will apply as AI and other um, technologies get rolled out. But the second point, I think, is that this creates an enormous opportunity for our country. Um, if there is one, if, I'm a, if, I would be, if I can be permitted, if the, since the Chancellor is not listening, to, to, to identify one area where our national economy uh, has a weakness, just one, um, it's productivity. Uh, we've had uh, slow to zero productivity growth for a number of years now, and our productivity is lower than some of our uh, direct competitor economies. And one of the reasons for that, as the Prime Minister has, has said recently, is because uh, we've had very abundant supplies of low-cost labour for the last 25 years, and that has meant UK businesses have underinvested in technology and growing productivity and reskilling staff and so on. And I think uh, the change in government policy to say that we now want uh, to, to end an era of mass uh, low-skill immigration and to move to a high-skill immigration but lower numbers stance creates an opportunity for businesses to make those investments they perhaps should have made in the past, but to do so using these new technologies that will increase productivity. So I see a massive opportunity presented by tech. And the good news, I think, is that the UK is already a global leader in these areas, particularly in artificial intelligence. So I'm delighted to be able to tell you that a new tech business is founded in the UK every 30 seconds which I think is pretty, pretty impressive. Um, three million jobs in tech. It is growing at double the rate of employment generally. And in the first half of this year alone, UK tech businesses raised £13.5 billion in venture capital funding. That is twice, that's a the leading figure in Europe by far. It's twice the level of the second European country, which was Germany. Uh, I've got no idea, by the way, where uh, France features or indeed what their technology strategy is. I understand it involves trying to sell some obsolete submarine technology, which they have discovered they suddenly have on their hands. Um, and as far as unicorns are concerned, uh, in the first half of this year, we had 20 unicorns, which were, um, which were gestated and given birth to, if you can give birth to a unicorn, in the UK. Uh, and we now have 105 unicorns, billion dollar companies in this country. That is more than Germany, France and Israel combined. And we are, as I say, leading, uh, leading Europe and I think leading the world in AI. And just to illustrate that point, I want to just mention a couple of companies in the UK who are doing unbelievable things in AI, because the, the, you can talk about it in general terms, but the specifics are extraordinary. Um, so Darktrace, for example, has AI-based cybersecurity systems which respond in real time and learn as uh, cybersecurity threats attack uh, companies and corporations' IT systems, and they respond without human intervention and they adapt in real time to threats as they evolve. Um, Accenture is a drug discovery AI platform. Uh, they are all using AI uh, discovering new drugs. The first drug they developed went into um, phase one clinical trials earlier this year, and it only took 12 months to develop. It normally takes years and years to get a new drug to phase one clinical trials. Um, they did it in just one year. Um, and uh, OBS Medical um, is applied AI uh, to patients in hospital, and it can predict, uh, they call it instability. In, I think what they mean is a euphemism. I think it means patients who are about to get really seriously ill. It monitors their vital signals, and it predicts in advance when they're going to have a critical incident. And of course, DeepMind, I've got to mention DeepMind, since Google is on the panel. Uh, DeepMind, a leading AI company here, who have, besides... Um, solving uh, or winning AlphaGo, which I suppose is not a particularly uh, real-world useful application, but they have, I think, <coughs> mapped every single pro or they plan to map every single one of the 100 million known proteins, which is uh, using AI, which is a genuinely um, useful application, and that's now been um, bought out by Google. So those are just a few examples of, of, of leading edge or even bleeding edge AI um, at, being used in the UK as we speak as part of our world-leading um, world ecosystem. Um, but I think there's, there's, there's some critical things that we as government need to do to make sure that continues, right? We can't rest on our laurels. We can't say, well, we're leading Europe. That's good enough. It's not good enough. We need to do more, and we need to beat China 
and America as well. And as I think about what makes a successful ecosystem, there are three things uh, that come to mind. Um, money, people, and ideas. Right? The ideas to innovate, the people to execute, and the money to finance it. And I think you need some sort of, um, sort of fusion of those three things, where the, 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 the ideas, the people, and the money are put together and sort of get some sort of super critical uh, event where the fusion is so tight that, that, that startups are born and become unicorns. And in each of those areas, we are doing well, but can do better. So with people, for example, we're overhauling our visa system so that the best people from around the world um, can come here basically straight away, right? No, no sort of uh, obstacles, no problems. You've got the global talent visa. Um, we've got the high potential uh, person visa, I think, starting in March next year. Fast growth companies can basically bring in critical staff from anywhere in the world um, without any sort of problem. We also need to train up people domestically, and that, whether that's um, the 1,000 PhDs in artificial intelligence we're funding with £100 million, whether it's the conversion courses for AI that the Chancellor announced mm. uh, a day or two ago, uh, we need to, to get people trained up. And if, we're gonna, if our economy is going to undergo this transition, training is critical to that. The second thing is ideas. So clearly, huge investment in R&D, raw research in universities is critical. Um, watch out for the spending review on the 27th of October um, for announcements in that area. Um, but beyond that, we need to make sure we're encouraging uh, tech transfer from universities into development. We've got to make sure the big data is available uh, to, to facilitate AI, AI um, hopefully without getting sued, as I think DeepMind possibly um, are at the moment. Uh, and we need to make sure that the compute capacity is available. Uh, and I think NVIDIA have, uh, have recently uh, established the UK's largest supercomputer called Cambridge One, um, which they're making available to pharmaceutical companies and others to run AI projects. So it's a clever bit of branding. It's called Cambridge One. It's actually in Harlow. Um, but they're, they're calling it Cambridge One to make it, uh, make it sound better. And then finally, the money. We've got, we've got a decent VC ecosystem. Balderton, who we're going to hear from, are one of the leading VCs in this area. But I think there is more we can do there. Uh, I'm conscious that some people say, and I'd be interested to hear um, Balderton's view on this, <coughs> that when it comes to Series C financing, it is a little harder in the UK than it is on the West Coast. I'm conscious that only 12% of, uh, of institutional investment into VCs by, uh, by, by uh, limited partners, only 12% comes from pension funds. In the US, that figure is 65%. So I think there is more we can do to encourage institutional capital into VC. Um, I think our IPO market in London is, is, is good, but could be better. So for example, when Accenture floated, uh, they floated on, on the NASDAQ, uh, not on the LSE. Uh, so I would like to work with my colleagues in the Treasury to make sure we get a bigger slice of that IPO market. Uh, but I think if we, we've got some great foundations without question the best in Europe. But if we can improve in those areas that I just mentioned, we can be not just the best in Europe, we can be the best in the world. Uh, what the government wants to do, what my priority is, is the newly appointed minister, is to clear the runway and make sure there are no obstacles in the way of the next generation of unicorns charging towards that billion dollar valuation status. I wanna make sure that they can all achieve their potential here in the United Kingdom. So I think the future is going to be a future of growth. Uh, I think it's going to be a future of, of unlimited opportunity and new possibility. I think our journey is just starting. I am optimistic about the future, and I'm excited to be part of it. And with you and others, I look forward to making it happen here in the UK. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic, and thank you. It's amazing that you have such a grip of the sort of portfolio already, given the sort of you know, very, very short time uh, you've been in the job, and exciting <coughs> things to come. I think we're going to try quickly, just in case it doesn't work later, to head across to James from Boulderton, um, uh, who's uh, joining us remotely, um, and, uh, and to sort of get his thoughts on where we're going and what we can do to sort of deliver upon the vision that the Minister has just outlined, and the things we need to do in the here and now, and the policy levers we need to pull to make sure that that vision is realised. Sure, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. It's a great Brilliant. testament That's to fantastic. the UK's and look, First of all, let me say, I'm, I'm very sad I can't be there in person today. Um, of course, to be with you all and also to be in my hometown in Manchester, uh, which I miss dearly. Even the drizzle of Manchester is better than the rain they have down south. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm very sorry. My wife is uh, 38 weeks pregnant. So if I have to disappear briefly it is for that reason alone and hopefully you won't mind me saying um when my wife goes into labor that that's, uh, that's going to be a good thing for this panel to cheer rather than uh, uh what how else it might be interpreted 
Um, so, so I'm a, a partner of Box and Capital with the largest um, venture fund focused in Europe, and the vast majority of what we do is focused on investing in British technology businesses. Uh, and that does mean uh, successes like Dark Trace already mentioned uh, in the Northwest, businesses like uh, Matillion and the Hutt Group, um, but, but across the country, and in fact, across the world, working with entrepreneurs. And I guess I come at this entire problem, uh, not with the view that we want to build another UK Google, but rather that we want to support another million uh, UK Larry Pages. That's the, 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 the real focus that I have um, as an investor in entrepreneurs. And uh, as the minister has already said, you know, we are in a fantastic place right now within the UK digital economy. And I think it's worth just repeating um, just which parts of it are really working. Uh, because I think one of the important things that we can all do is really make sure this is very much at the top of the government's agenda. I think the minister uh, read out some fantastic stats already. Uh, you know, there are 3 million people now working in the UK's digital economy. Uh, UK businesses spend 150 billion pounds a year on software. So we're an important buying market, not just a producing market. Um, UK businesses, not the government, spend 20 billion pounds a year uh, in R&D alone. I think the digital economy makes up about 8% of total GVA. And uh, Manchester was the fastest growing tech hub for digital jobs last year in 2020. Um, so it's a very robust part of the economy. It's also a really important enabler, as we all felt in COVID uh, like never before. Um, the ability to work online and to work with software tools today uh, really allowed our economy to continue to thrive in very difficult times. And so not only should we be focusing on the digital economy in itself, but also as infrastructure. And, and then finally, I think um, one of the key cultural changes that we've seen certainly over the last decade and accelerated by COVID has been an embracing of entrepreneurship in the UK. You know, if you take entrepreneurs to be people uh, working for their own businesses or working as freelancers or, or working even in the gig economy, they now make up about 15% of the total UK workforce. That's double where it was a couple of decades ago. And if anything, we think this trend is going to accelerate. We're going to see more and more people in the economy working as entrepreneurs, whether that's in startups or creative roles or freelance roles. And as a result, this new area of work, this new way of working, I think needs to be addressed uh, with government policy. I think it's fantastic we're focusing on uh, changes like AI and life sciences. But actually what that means for most people day to day is how does that affect their new and growing businesses and the new roles available to them if they do take the entrepreneurship path? So there's a lot to be excited about. Um, I wanted to highlight just some of the areas uh, mentioned already and add a few as well from our perspective here as investors in, in hundreds of businesses across, across the UK. As mentioned, skills is, is absolutely critical. And I think as we saw in the Chancellor's speech yesterday, the focus on, on new AI scholarships, and as we've seen in the UK innovation strategy uh, policy uh, come out earlier this year and the UK's AI policy come out earlier this year as well, um, there's some great focus on specific skills we're missing here in the UK today. However, if you look at how those skills needs have changed over the last 20 years, there's always a skills shortage in some area. You know, 10 years ago, it was HTML and CSS for web development. About five years ago, it was mobile apps and everyone needed a mobile development. When I left school, no joke, someone said to me, you should go into designing ringtones because there's a lot of money in that um, when the Nokia still ruled the world. So I think rather than think about the specific <laughs> skills needs we have, although that is incredibly important, it's also about the platform that we can provide to people to access those skills and train themselves over time. You know, when I think about the opportunities people have to finance their way into university today, opening up that financing, giving people the equivalent of the student loan to explore different areas of skills throughout their lifetime so that they can continue to compete in a, in, in a new market, but also to continue to adapt and adopt new technologies is really, really important. And we've sort of put forward some strategies around that before. We can have a debate about how we can do that better. You know, the Chancellor's Kickstart Scheme and other things the government have been doing uh, in this area, really interesting starts on that pathway. Secondly, I've mentioned it already, uh, and as Chris and many other people on the panel and perhaps in the audience know, starting a business is one of the most difficult things you can do. But we really believe that more and more people in the British economy are going to start a business. And currently, the government's got kind of a mixed feeling about this, I feel, because on one side, they want to support entrepreneurship. But on the other side, they talk about wanting high productivity and higher paid jobs. And, you know, as we see today, if you look at the productivity of entrepreneurs and, and smaller businesses, on, in general, it's lower than some of the larger businesses. Now, there's two ways you can react to that. You can say, well, we must get people into these higher productive, larger technology businesses. Or you say, no, we need to make sure entrepreneurs as well have the skills and support to be more productive on when they start their businesses as well. And I think there's lots we can do in that earlier stage. You know, 
many decades ago, Britain started the Open University, which is a huge success. Um, but now I think we should be looking at the Open MBA. Like, where is the ongoing support to helping people start their businesses and develop their businesses over time? Um, in the same way, new businesses getting started face a lot of regulation and a lot of scrutiny, completely understandably. And you have to provide a lot of data to HMRC, for example, when you're paying your taxes. But why isn't HMRC starting to provide that data back to entrepreneurs so they can learn, oh, do you know you're spending more on your rent or you're spending more on your software um, than other businesses? Maybe you want to explore this kind of opportunity. This is where your cogs are compared to other businesses in your area. So if the government's going to take all this data, why not also find ways to give it back to help entrepreneurs to grow? And the sort of final point I want to make, uh, as has been discussed before just earlier, uh, was on the, the move from startups to scale-ups in the UK. Um, the minister's completely right. We've had an absolute explosion of venture capital, I'm happy to say, here in the UK over, over the last decade. It's grown um, more than 5x in terms of the, the dollars. And unfortunately, because it's a global market, it's measured in dollars, invest into UK businesses. Um, but there's two big missing parts. One, as has been mentioned, is that that later stage. I spoke to a phenomenal um, autonomous vehicle software business yesterday, uh, leading lights out, spun out of Cambridge, 30% of the people that work there used to work at one of the big four tech companies, including uh, Google's sister company, Waymo, and many of them moved to the UK to work for this business. Um, they're working with some of our biggest grocery delivery companies, and yet now they're thinking about raising very significant capital to compete with the likes of Waymo and Tesla. They have to look abroad. They have to look internationally because there is not that level of funding from Series C and beyond here in the UK for them to be able to raise. And the second challenge is, even if they did find UK-based institutional investors like Boulderton, we are investors in this business, so I'm not going to mention his name uh, for fear of skewing the market, but like Boulderton, you know, a vast majority of our capital comes from international investment. We can't raise from UK pension funds because of existing government regulation. Once again, the mixed messages of we want British investment to go into British businesses, but also we restrict the ability of certain people to invest in the technology field. And I think tackling that and making sure that British pensioners and British savers benefit from our huge technological <laughs> success in the same way that American savers and Canadian savers, by the way, are today, is a really important part of the puzzle uh, we need to solve. And my, my final, final comment will be, obviously, uh, it's wonderful to have the new minister here. Uh, he's got an incredible background, a very relevant background to this role. Uh, but obviously, we still think the digital economy being so important, it should be a role, perhaps, that doesn't sit in culture and media anymore, but maybe should be sitting somewhere else in central government. But that's obviously beyond my pay grade. Fantastic, James. And thank you so much for joining us today. I hope... Uh... I hope it's uh, you don't have to rush out, but it's sort of we always say never expect the unexpected at Policy Exchange. I think this would certainly be unique. I'm going to turn now to Katie, who uh, runs a small online search engine. <laughs> uh, you may have heard of it called Google. We have you know three themes I think really coming out here, which is skills, investment, regulation. How does Google see it, and what more can we do to go forward? Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, and apologies for the croaky voice. Um, suffering too much fun at, at conference. Um, I think, uh, actually, it's been great to hear the Minister's view and, and James's view, and I think says really squarely the potential that the UK has at the moment, and that's something that Google, over the you know past 15 years here, but um, over the last five years or so, is, is really interested in doing. And I think the, the framing of this panel is you know how do we use digital to drive the recovery and then you know is that going to be a leveling up recovery and i think it's unavoidable that digital won't drive the recovery and we saw that with all the businesses that are local to us during the pandemic that actually when they pivot to digital um they did more and you know i live in a, a london suburb in the southeast of london sort of halfway between croydon and, and central london and i could see some of my groceries you know immediately starting taking orders and deliveries through WhatsApp and actually growing their businesses fantastically through the pandemic and others. There's a garden centre who sort of said, please email us if you want something. And they, you know, they fell over in a, a day or so because they just couldn't switch to online. Um, and I think what we want to do at Google is make sure that actually all businesses are able to thrive online. And, and that for us is non-negotiable. Our, our mission is to make the world's information universally accessible. And so we want all businesses to be able to um, grow. And we know that when you're online, you grow twice as fast. Um, so I totally agree with the minister's um, framing of this, that the UK is actually has a massive opportunity to get this right and to get this right for a generation. Um, and we really want to play our part in that. So 
over the last five or six years, we realised that this opportunity that was being realised on digital growth for businesses wasn't being equally recognised. Um, we saw a lot of growth in London and the South East, a lot of growth in technical startups, but actually small businesses more generally were kind of often feeling that digital wasn't for them. So we started something called the Digital Garage. Um, which has visited, um, we actually launched the first in Leeds, I think the second was in Manchester, um, spends between three and six months in cities and had bus tours and had been everywhere and reached about 700,000 people um, to provide training to small businesses who want to harness digital to do more. Um, we looked at the economic impact, not just of that work, but actually of businesses using Google, not just to find local customers, but actually to export around the world, to connect with buyers exactly when they needed them. Um, last year, that was about £55 billion pounds worth um, across the economy, with the size of Bristol's GDP being added by small businesses who were using digital for the first time in the pandemic. So the potential is really there to be harnessed. Um, and then the third thing we're doing is looking at that skills investment of how you meet, meet the skills need um, of today. Um, I, we haven't looked at ringtone um, <laughs> development, maybe that's something that the moment has passed, but we've developed something called the Google Career Certificate and, you know, very conscious that you don't need to sign up to a three-year expensive degree, but actually you can do the training where you are and when you are. And we're delighted to partner with the Department for Work and Pensions to deliver that. Um, and that gives people access to immediate training in user interface design or in project management or in IT help desk um, skills so that really you can harness people looking to change jobs. Um, so I think the government has a lot of... Um, policies and areas of strength to build from. I think the plan for digital regulation, which DCMS put out before the summer, which is, is quite wonky, but very important in terms of framing when it's right to use um, legislation and actually where you can get um, co-regulation or self-regulation or industry standards actually to provide the environment that the businesses need to succeed without slowing down growth. AI strategy, I think, has lots of um, important potential too. And we've seen the Treasury, with help to grow, actually harness um, the ability for small businesses to use technology to um, increase productivity. But there's much more I think the government need to be done. And I think recognising that this is an area for positive intervention is what will change this from some businesses succeeding to actually meeting that levelling up agenda. So I think making sure that the regulatory freedom the UK now has is properly exploited and thought through rather than doing things because there's a kind of inevitable something needs to be done mentality. I think providing the opportunity for training where people need it and at a cost they can afford. Um, and thinking about how small businesses, both those that don't want to scale up, and that is a conscious mindset of, of many, um, those that do can use technology to improve um, productivity. So I think there's much to play for over the next few years in the UK, and it's, it's exciting to be part of it. Oh, brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Casey. That was fantastic. I'm going to turn now to Chris. Uh, for those of you who don't know, when he worked in Downing Street, Chris set up the Integrated Review of Foreign Policy, Security and Defence, um, and has been a sort of incredible addition to the policy exchange team. Um, Chris, we've heard quite a lot about how to improve investment and skills, but I think another crucial element to all of this is national resilience. Mm. Um, now that so much of GDP is online, how can we ensure that UK business and citizens are able to manage and mitigate the sort of threats emerging from cyberspace? And furthermore, you know, we're policy exchange, we like to think internationally. You know, what can we do to work with our international partners and allies to sort of further the interests of the digital economy? Um, Benjamin, thank you for that, for that question. Uh, I think it... it, um, it is apparent to all of us that as we're looking at the rate of change and we're looking at the increase in value, we're looking at the, the way that we want to make this a safe place for value to increase um, for at all levels of, of, of business, that that carries degrees of risk, that carries in the way that we're attempting to put into place new economic development, new economic areas, new ways of generating that wealth, that that becomes very attractive, um, not only to uh, those who would see the UK's role in the world, the UK's um, uh, GDP, how much of that now goes online, um, to challenge that, to thwart our own economic development, as well as the risk that sits in there from, from um, frankly, you know, criminal gangs and other people who want to exploit an area that's expanding so fast that regulation and security can't necessarily sit around it um, and, and protect it. 
Um, given the amount of digital prosperity we rely upon, the ability to secure technology, the ability to secure data, the ability to ensure that the network, which bears all of that wealth creating and wealth generating opportunity, is a government responsibility or a national responsibility to look after. It's quite a significant one. And occasionally sort of feels, um, not that it's undone, but it doesn't appear to be quite as apparent as it ought to be. Um, I'm, I'm occasionally cast my mind back to um, how Britain historically succeeded through its merchant shipping and how it traded around the world and how it got into a position whereby the situation we found ourselves in um, relied upon how that trade worked and how we were able to export. We allowed that merchant navy to operate with the protection of the Royal Navy. We would never have sent out a red ensign to sea without a white ensign following on behind it. And somehow I think in the way that we're expanding at this rate, in the amount of extraordinary value that we're creating at the same time, it's never wholly apparent how we're going to protect that um, as, a, as a national responsibility. Um, we all know that those sort of broad figures, uh, broad percentages of attacks um, that, are, that are brought through on a sort of cyber threat. So, you know, about 40% of businesses, about 25% of charities in the last 12 months have all been sub subject to some form of cyber attack uh, upon, their, upon them as an institution. And, and in both of those cases, about 20% of them suffer some form of loss lose something, whether it's in terms of reputation, whether it's in terms of data, whether it's in terms of value, whether it's in terms of ransomware, whatever it is that's paid out toward them. And that is clearly something that we you know, bear responsibility and have to think about how we're going to run that and challenge toward it. So we have digital space as a contested space. And when, um, as Benjamin referred to, when we th thought about putting the integrated review together and the ideas that were going to go into that, we looked at where that risk and threat towards our national prosperity and the development of our um, uh, digital GDP were going to come from. And, and, and of course, it sits um, exactly within that. So not only do we face the challenges from you know, weapons-grade cyber that is used by states who are opposed to us and opposed to us succeeding, and I, I won't um, overhype at that sort of degree of threat, but we would all be aware that it is a, um, a reality. It's where it has that effect upon everyday life. So the transfer between what we work with in our digital GDP and our digital economy and that which goes on um, in reality, your critical national infrastructure is attacked and therefore you have no transport network, you have no power network, <coughs> you can't get your garden centre or your online groceries you know, to work because that, um, that is also being undermined and it, and it saps uh, the confidence in the way that we um, want to be able to go and do this. I'm pleased that there are, there are you know, policy levers in place for this to be effective. So DCMS have um, a cyber review, business resilience, cyber security review um, coming up in the next sort of three months or so. And that's one of those things that we you know, it would aim to lean into and welcome because that is a way of developing confidence in those smaller businesses, in that sort of growth that we want to see cascading, and how everyone thinks that if I'm going to work in that arena and I'm going to invest wealth in that arena and I'm going to in, you know, invest my future in that arena, it is going to be safe and secure with a degree of resilience that um, is guaranteed in place for us to, to work on. Um, we, we have been here before, like most policy, and we've both, of course, worked in policy at number 10. We've seen where the idea starts and then it starts to progress a little bit further forward, but without a standard bearer to take it, it's quite hard to see it land and, and be effective. Um, <clears throat> the previous, uh, in 2016, the government had a five-year national cybersecurity strategy, um, which um, came with a very neat, um, just short of £2 billion worth of, uh, of funding um, to support it, including um, just over a, a, a billion, I think £1.3 billion pounds worth for the national cybersecurity programme, um, quite a lot of which is developed and concentrated here in Manchester um, as, a real, um, as a real hub of expertise. Um, but it didn't quite come with all those policy threads that policy geeks um, like me and a number of us at Policy Exchange get excited about how it's sewn together and stitched together and turned into something that's, um, that's very effective. Uh, and money was drifted into different ways and it went off into uh, different areas and it never quite got on to that point. I think we're now at a tipping point. Post-COVID, post the point at which we um, have left the European Union, post the point at which we are looking to develop some of that newfound lack of regulation and opportunities to set our own <coughs> paths out forward to us to, to ensure that, you know, where that funding exists, where it's stitched together, where for those of us who think that a beautiful policy plan is a thing of beauty, um, it, you know, that, that's much more effective as it works. And I, and I think that the reason f for that domestically to be 
together and coherent and cohesive is important because it means that we place ourselves in a prominent position to set some international standards, as we do in so many other things globally. So whether that's about insurance markets or shipping standards or any of those other areas that we rely upon in what feels like um, you know, another side of the economy, here in the digital economy, we've got exactly the same opportunity, and I think that's, a, uh, that's quite an important way um, for us to, um, to, to lead forward. We, we would all be familiar, I think, probably in this room more than most, about you know, the scale on which we're thinking of how much is at value and at risk here. Um, 75 billion internet connected devices uh, uh, you know, around the world, the vast majority of which, 90%, have got only the most basic of security applications um, applied to them. Benjamin and I were talking um, uh, before uh, uh, this particular uh, event um, about you know, which were the key, which were the, the, the most extraordinary hacks that, that had gone in. And, and we were um, discussing how a hacker in 2017, for those of you who are familiar with it, managed to secure the bank details from all of the high rolling players within a casino um, as, they, as they accessed in and out because there was proximity to a, um, uh, a, thermostat, a thermometer within a fish tank in the room in which they all participated and played their sort of casino games. Uh, and the ingenuity of looking for what that vulnerability is, what that weak spot is, how in this extraordinary connected world that we rely upon the opportunities to generate um, um, wealth um, can be so so e easily exploited. Uh, now I know that um, at DCMS, and certainly from the National Cybersecurity Centre, you know that is there is an ongoing piece of work about how we reduce that vulnerability um, uh, uh, as it exists. But um, just to move on um, briefly, uh, Benjamin, because I'm conscious of time, onto the second element of that, which I which I think was also an important part of. Um, the posture that the government is leading on, the way that the integrated review, when it thinks about security, also um, leads and thoughts about this, refers back to my point about being able to set international standards to make not only us resilient and a very safe place in which to work, but to be able to share some of that resilience with, with, with um, um, nations um, that we wish to be uh, in international alliance and collaboration with. So when we look at sustaining our strategic advantage through science and technology, some of that is going to come up on the share. The, the panel that we had on before this on the integrated review um, was inevitably asked the question about AUKUS and submarines. And of course, the, the underlying story with that was not necessarily about where our submarines are going to go to. It's about the technology share that we're able, as, as liberal democracies, to be able to share with our allies and create that degree of defence and cooperation through that alliance that makes what we do within the UK stronger and more resilient and therefore allows us to be able to cooperate with, with allies um, to ensure that that's the case. It does tie into, especially as we look into the in the Pacific, as we look toward export, as we look toward that <coughs> international property, as we look toward our soft power, there's a very strong advantage that we have here that, that we should be capitalising on. Um, um, you know, G7 earlier um, this year um, uh, picked up some obvious alliances that were set out, but quite ambitious programmes on how that science and technology was to be shared. And I think in some of the um, developing areas for new markets to expand, I certainly think between the UK and India, that's a very plausible area that we should be concentrating on, and I hope that the United Kingdom continues to keep that lead for it. Brilliant. Thank you so much, right. Chris. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, what I really love about this panel is that we've been able to get some of the sort of most creative people into Manchester uh, from the digital economy, which isn't always the case as you've been to Conservative Conference, uh, that you have the sort of innovators and the sort of people right at the cutting edge of modern day. But we, I thought we'd now turn to questions from the audience. We only have two rules for questions here at Policy Exchange. You can ask whatever you want, but you must state your name and organisation and Secondly, it's an opportunity to ask a question, not to tell a story or to provide a great treatise on everything you think is wrong with government and the digital economy. So with that in mind, I thought we might take a couple of questions from the audience, if anybody would like to ask one. So you've got a lady in the front here, um, a gentleman there, and a gentleman just behind him, I think we'll start with. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, I want to talk about levelling up. Sorry, oh, we're going to have a question. I hope two questions. Brilliant. Right. So, in levelling up, of course, digital jobs and digital businesses are going to be the fuel for levelling up. Um, my first question is about geography. Um, uh, there's been a lot of talk about levelling up red wall constituencies, left behind communities. Yeah, yeah. So, how can we make sure that this is in those geographies? And the second one is. 
we have 10 million people who have low or no digital skills. <coughs> uh, we know bringing them online brings 23 billion net present value. So how can we make sure that they're in the pipeline and not just graduates? Brilliant, thank you. Um, and the gentleman at the end there. I think, Helen, you're from the Good Things Foundation. <laughs> Um, I'm Robert from uh, Policy Connect. Um, I was really struck by uh, what the minister was saying about taking a positive attitude toward technology, and it seems to me that um, part of that is where there are risks associated with technology or um, issues such as cybersecurity that we look to technology itself to be part of the answer to mm. uh, addressing those. And I'd be interested to hear what people think about uh, you know, how we can use technology to yep. uh, address those potential kind of inequalities, such as um, you know using accessibility, accessible design, so that disabled people can can get the most out of technology. Brilliant, thank you. And the gentleman just behind you. Thanks, uh, Nick Taylor from Revolut. Um, it was good to hear the minister talk about IPOs um, and what the government's going to do there. A question on how you're going to work with Treasury to keep the momentum up. There was a Lord Hill review, um, but that was almost a year ago, and we've got to see that implemented. And then also, how are we going to tackle some of the sort of societal um, things where investors in the UK just don't aren't as comfortable investing in high growth technology companies? And sorry for disclosure, um, Bold Boulderton is one of our key investors um, in our Series A <laughs> round. So thank you, James and team. <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. Well, I'm going to turn to the minister. We've got three fantastic questions there, covering technology being part of the answer, how we get the unskilled online and the massive GDP stuff that comes from it, Series C investment and how to make it better. But also, I thought you might like to take the opportunity to come back on some of the things we've heard from the panel. Um, well, let me try and uh, really quickly answer those three questions, and I'm sure the panel have, have views uh, as well. So, look, first of all, on, on levelling up, uh, I mean, there is a conscious effort by the government to try and make sure that areas outside London and the South East are, uh, are driven forward in this area as well. I was in Leeds uh, just a few days ago, uh, the Leeds Digital Festival, talking about some of our work there, launching a local uh, digital skills partnership in uh, East Yorkshire and the Humber, the eighth such uh, partnership designed to do exactly what you were describing. And the British Business Bank uh, is also investing half a billion pounds via the Northern Powerhouse Investment Fund, specifically in the North, as the name implies. And uh, to your point about lifetime skills, I mean, you're right, it's not just about the thousand uh, PhDs in artificial intelligence at the sort of top end, it's about everybody. And there's, for example, this year alone, another £95 million been made av available for lifetime skills. So people who are not currently working in the digital economy might have issues of the kind you described, um, and it's to get them retrained. So it's across the entire spectrum that we need to um, invest in digital skills. Um, there was a question, I think, from the Revolut, um, the Revolut uh, gentleman, uh, I think you were asking um, firstly about IPOs and can we, and following up the Lord Hill report. So uh, I think that's an excellent question. Uh, I intend to meet with my colleague, the city, city minister, um, to ask about that. And I'm just going to ask um, Ed from my office to take a note for me to go and meet with um, the city minister uh, to ask how we're getting on with the Lord Hill follow-up. So we'll take that as an action arising uh, from this, um, this meeting, uh, instant action. And uh, on your point about the apparent reluctance of um, UK institutions, particularly pension funds, to allocate large amounts of capital into VC. I mean, that's an issue that is very much at the forefront uh, of my mind. If we got even uh, like a 3% allocation from UK pensions into VC, that would have a transformative effect on the amount of capital available. Um, I, am, I know DWP looked, did some work earlier this year on the 0.75% fee cap, um, so I'm going to just um, sort of discuss that with colleagues. Um, but I think there's also a point about exhortation, just talking to pension funds, UK pension funds, about the return opportunities that they are potentially missing. Uh, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister wrote to UK, a bunch of UK pension funds, I think in August, making that point. Mm. And I want to um, sort of follow up myself, now I'm in post, um, exhorting UK institutions to embrace this opportunity because it will obviously by generating higher returns, uh, benefit their schemes, as well as helping to give the UK tech sector and the VC sector a, uh, a shot in the arm. Um, and there was, I think, a point at the front here about how we can embrace technology to fight off cyber attacks, and I think, um, which I agree with, and I think Darktrace is a brilliant example of, of a UK AI company that I mentioned earlier, uh, whose technology does, uh, does exactly, exactly that. 
So I hope that responds to each of the three uh, questions. Thank you. I thought I'll now head back just quickly to Katie to sure. see what you wanted to sort of um, say on that topic. Yeah, and I, I won't answer Nick's question because I think I won't do a better job than you got from the Minister. Um, I think just on the geography point, when we started um, the Digital Garage, and actually I hope I'm not sacked for admitting this, one of the um, names we considered was Level Up because we very consciously wanted to get out of London where we spent a long time investing with the startup community and take digital skills to people where they needed them. So we've been to Sheffield, we've been to Liverpool, we've been to Manchester, we've been to Sunderland, all the places that you wouldn't necessarily expect Google to prioritise. Um, and I think we just need to keep doing more of that, to be honest, and it's fantastic the government um, sees that as a priority too. Um, in terms of, um, you know, how do we get people to access technology and, and make the most of it to meet these challenges? Again, I think that's bringing skills to people where they need it. You know, we talked about the Open University, you know, 30, 40 years ago, and digital just provides that seamless opportunity for people. And I was in the Arsenal Stadium of all places recently meeting with people that had done the Google Career Certificate. There was a guy there who was, you know, 25, really young family, hadn't been able to afford to go to university, had actually previously been last time in the Arsenal Stadium mm. cleaning the toilets there and had done, you know, through his DWP work call, um, coach, one of our Google career certificates and was now applying for jobs in technology industry. Now, those things cost money, absolutely true, but they don't cost as much as a degree and the opportunity for people to do them after hours, informally from home around existing employment is so important and I think that that's something we should really embrace both in the corporate sector and actually um, other employers and the government. There's massive potential there. Fantastic. Well, just before coming back to Chris, we're going to try online um, to go back with James, sort of get his view on all of this. I mean, we've heard some words from the minister about, you know, giving VCs a shot in the arm and all the rest of it. But there's an underlying kind of regulatory change that needs to happen as well, isn't there? Yes, yeah, certainly. So the investment big bang, which which we were very supportive of, and the letter that the chancellor and the prime minister wrote to the pension industry was fantastic in August. But you know, change is slow. I think of the FTSE 350 businesses today, there are eight what we call Web 2.0 businesses listed on there, and that's up from two a year and a half ago. So you know, change is happening, but change is slow. And I think one of the best ways that you can encourage more pension funds and, and more investment on the FTSE and on uh, publicly listed companies on the LSE is to get those funds invested earlier in the uh, lifetime of those businesses. Because if you are coming into a business just when it's public, you know, you're only just learning about it in the IPO prospectus and beyond. Allowing those pension funds to invest pre-IPO gives them more exposure to the board and the businesses. And now, if you look at Revolut, as is, as is public, you know, their investors are headquartered in Tokyo, in New York, in Switzerland, and in London. You know, Balderson was the first institutional investor, and certainly amongst them. Um, but we're just one voice there. And so allowing more UK-based investors to make those kind of investments means there's more people around the board who are saying, look at the FTSE, look at the successes. Now, you know, one great example of this, however, happened last week. You know, Oxford Nanopore listed, uh, I think it's surpassed £4 billion now. Um, a company called Selexa, which was a Cambridge spin-out, sold for £400 million 10 years ago to an American company. It's great to see a British genomics company going public here at £4 billion. So things are changing. Um, but there's a long way to go. And there are regulatory changes required around the way the DWP allows or doesn't allow rather pension funds to, to take risks with certain asset classes. So I think, um, you know, the IPO agenda has started. Lord Hill's reforms are great. There's a long way to go there still. Um, on, on sort of how do we train people in levelling up? Well, we've done this. I mean, I am the generation or part of the generation that went from less than 10%, I think it was, of the workforce going to university to more than 50%. We have seen that massive skill shift in the last 25 years where because of cultural change, because of the availability of financing, because of the way uh, employers are incentivized, suddenly people who never gone to university before, I was the first person in my family to go to university, for example, went to university. Now what we need to do is make it the norm to retrain later in your career. We need to make it the norm so when you hit 30, you, you, you do six months off and you go and spend three months. Maybe you want to do your second gap year or whatever, but maybe you want to spend three months retraining. Or we make it the norm for a business to take one day off a year to provide free training to their staff and encourage them through tax breaks. And there are some policies out there already uh, ongoing around this. And I think uh, the UK innovation strategy, when it gets put into place, uh, will do a lot to help here. Uh, and then finally, on, on levelling up, you know, technology should be the biggest enabler of this. Remote work 
has completely changed uh, the way COVID works. I think it's a huge <laughs> opportunity. Um, you know, GitLab, which is a business which will go public on NASDAQ uh, this week at $9 billion, will be the first ever completely remote software company to do that. They have many employees across the UK, very few of them, if any, are in London. They're spread out across the country, right? Mm -hmm. It's amazing that can happen now, but we need to support the technology industry to do that. And the final thing I will say is there are some infrastructural things we can do too. And just to give you one example, um, one of the big areas of growth is life sciences and biotech in the UK. Today, if you want to access a laboratory, it's like getting a hold of a computer 30 years ago. I don't know what you know what it was like in the physics department, Chris, 25 years ago when, when you were at university. Uh, but you know, only universities and government institutions had access to computers. Today, that's the same thing with laboratories. And yet we talk about building a life sciences revolution. So let's get infrastructure like labs into the towns that we want to level up, which will bring in the remote workers who are experts in biosciences and biotech to innovate and build businesses around them. Uh, fantastic. I'm, I'm conscious we've only got 10 minutes left and our, 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 our events manager was staring angrily at me at the back of the room. I think this is a great testament to the proximity of the topic. I'm going to quickly come to Chris. Chris, I, I know that when you ran all of Theresa May's business engagement, you were very, very keen to go out there to chat to the most innovative companies and make sure their voice was heard around the policy discussion. These are companies that are at the cutting edge that probably don't have the kind of capabilities always to engage with government. What can we do to make sure their voices are heard rather than just the bigger players who might have the sort of resources to engage? Um, that's a very interesting question. I think that um, certainly when you want to get that sort of view into number 10 rather than through one of the specialist um, uh, departments or ministries, I think the piece that always catches the eye, and certainly the Prime Minister, um, is... is always very vigilant for something that's going to get out there and catch his eye that he conceives as being innovative and leading and groundbreaking and something that we could all get behind although I'm conscious that people are generally terrified when they hear the words I'm from the government and I'm here to help you, um, <laughs> you know, we can change the prism that works around all of this my experience of it is that I was thinking of a, I was thinking of a particular business when we were describing levelling up a moment uh, or, or so ago, who relocated from Shetland to Manchester um, because this was the best place to be able to run the business from in terms of the way he wanted to, to generate um, uh, uh, a real expansion of what he was able to do um, economically. We sometimes have to shift our prism. You, the policies and attraction fixates on what do we take from London, the South East, or from around Cambridge, or from around wherever there are these little economic clusters, and put them somewhere else. We should remind ourselves that it can occur all over the place. And if it happens to occur in, in the Shetland Islands, and sees Manchester as south, quite some way south, actually, rather than continuing to see it um, as being up north, uh, as others would have it, um, you, you, we just need to shift the way that that works. And I think that when you're demonstrating your value, when you're demonstrating what you can do, some combination between what you're doing economically, but really importantly, what you're able to do in enabling people. And, and I'd really echo James's second point um, that he's previously made about how this enables people to retrain, refocus, give themselves a second opportunity at a different point within, within their career structures to offer all of those. If you're able to demonstrate not only your economic worth, but your societal worth and value as well, you're always going to catch the eye and the attention, and therefore I would hope, certainly the impetus of, of government getting and, and being behind you. And, and again, although it's purely coincidental, but um, Oxford Nanopore and Dark Trace, mm. I've certainly seen uh, where they have been so prominent four years ago, five years ago, that the Prime Minister made a particular point about taking them on the trade trip to India because they were an extraordinary example of what the UK could do and develop. And here we are four years later, they're both worth billions and billions of pounds as that f flip has gone further. So it's a combination between both Benjamin, it's that. Obviously the economic piece of but the societal impact that you can make and the change you can have and the impact you can have on people's lives is a really important and fundamental part of how you catch the selector's eye. Brilliant. Fantastic. Right, we're going to go back to questions from the audience. We have one at the back there from Annabelle Dixon um, uh, in the blue dress. <laughs> Hi, Annabelle Dixon from Politico. I had a question about regulation uh, for the minister. Um, do you think the draft online safety bill is where it should be? And can you see it changing much before the spring? Um, and in which areas? And um, secondly, do you think Paul Dacre would make a good chairman of Ofcom? Fantastic. I think we also had another hand somewhere over here. Yes, sir. So, um, 
clearly a lot of these tech companies start off as SEIs schemes, EIS schemes, which are inheritance tax-free, but uh, VCTs aren't. So if you want to uh, uh, surely, uh, you know, grow your VC uh, funds uh, and, uh, you know, particularly for, you know, Series C financing, uh, inst incentivizing people to buy acres of rural land, incentivize them to put their land, put their money in uh, VCT funds. Uh, which currently aren't in inheritance tax-free. The dividends are, but Brilliant. not the funds themselves. Fantastic, thank you. And I'm also going to ruthlessly abuse my position as chair to ask the minister some questions, if that's okay. I mean, we're in a situation where we have endless reams of strategies produced by DCMS. We have a digital strategy in 2017. We've got another one coming out that's 18 months late. We have a national data strategy with a national data implementation strategy. I mean, is it the case that actually we're just quite good at talking the talk? We don't always walk the walk. I mean, the, you know, it's the case whereby it doesn't look like the online harms or the online safety bill now is going to come into law till 2024. Um, we're also in a situation whereby we've downgraded all of our digital connectivity ideas. So it's great to say level up, but actually nobody's going to have full fibre broadband by 2025, which was the original target. I don't know. I just thought I'd sort of throw that out there and sort of see how you reacted. But uh, obviously I have ruthlessly abused my position as chair to do so. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Chris, <laughs> and sort of see well, what you, you, you do will with say, that. You've all saved the, uh, the tough questions um, for, the, uh, for the very end. Uh, so uh, on the, I'm not going to comment on individuals and their potential uh, positions, uh, obviously. Um, on the, uh, your question about the online harms bill, uh, I'm obviously having arrived in the department just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I am looking at whether there are uh, areas where we can go further to make sure that people, uh, particularly children, but, 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 but adults as well, are uh, properly protected from the harms which they may uh, suffer. And there are, I think, one or two areas where uh, we might want to consider going uh, further. Um, but that is, that is something I'm, I'm looking at um, as, we, as we speak. On the question about uh, SEIS and EIS, so obviously SEIS and EIS um, really speak to the seed stage, the startup stage, rather than the scale-up stage, um, and uh, and clearly the sort of Series C stuff is 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 way above um, EIS and SEIS. And as, as you know, the the uh, SEIS per company limit is one hundred and fifty thousand pounds, and the EIS company limit is five million pounds a year and twelve million pounds across the lifetime, um, unless it's a uh, knowledge-intensive company, in which case I think it's twenty million. So. Uh, those are very effective schemes. Um, the Treasury obviously uh, lead on the policy for those, um, and uh, you know, um, no doubt they will keep them under um, very uh, careful review. But I can't, I can't speak to the Treasury's um, plans in those areas, other than to say that I've had personal experience of the success of of both of those um, schemes when I've founded businesses in the past, um, which then went on to um, went on to grow quite a great deal. Uh, now there was a, uh, a rather loaded, <laughs> a rather loaded and pointed question at the end there, um, which uh, which I assume was addressed more to my predecessors than to me, since I. <laughs> have, and you, but by the way, you forgot the AI strategy last week. Uh, to add to the, that was quite good. That was quite okay. Okay, well that was the one, that was the one I that was the one I launched. So I'm taking I'm taking credit for that. Um, look, I mean clearly um, clearly we need to translate uh, strategic intent into action. Um, and interestingly, uh, Demis Hassabis um, tweeted uh, just after we launched the AI strategy, um, saying he's excited to see how the strategy turns into action. And I think my focus as a newly appointed minister is to do exactly that, to turn strategic intent into actions. Um, and I will certainly um, certainly be looking to do that in the coming months, um, particularly for the AI, the AI strategy, but for the others as well. Um, I think your your point about the um, the gigabit rollout was about a little unfair. I mean, there is a five billion pound investment in making sure that um, gigabit rollout is happening, and I think I think half the half the homes in the UK currently have the ability to access. Um, gigabit speed broadband. So I think I think we're doing uh, we're doing doing good work there. But I'm sure I'm sure that will continue. Fantastic, thank you. And I apologise once again for going power mad. Um, so I thought we would just have a quick statement from every single panelist to conclude. Um, I think we'll finish with the minutes. So I'll start with James uh, in, in 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 London, and then we'll come back down the panel. Thanks so much, Ben. Look, thanks for having me. I think um, obviously the fact that I can do this remotely is is a reminder of just how important our digital economy is. I think the infrastructure and the foundations of what Britain has built over the last decade have been uh, you know, incredibly impressive, and we should be very proud of everything we've done here. But it's taken a huge amount of work. And as the minister said initially, the real revolution is yet to begin. 
whether that's the growth of entrepreneurship or the implications of AI and life sciences, there's huge opportunities still to be grasped. And I think making sure you're working alongside business and entrepreneurs where you do that is incredibly important. Uh, obviously, we hope uh, to be able to continue to invest in the pace we have in the UK and see continued success uh, through the many different levels of funding uh, going forward. Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to turn to Chris next, just for sort of quick minutes and a half. Of uh, I, think, I think the important piece to take away from this, Benjamin, is the, is the element, um, and uh, Minister has reflected upon it a moment ago, it's about turning that strategic intent, intent into action. And we can all sit and talk about it and obsess about what a beautiful piece of policy it is, but until it turns into action, it's not going to change people's personal circumstances, it's not going to change the, the digital economy, it's not going to have an impact upon where we sit for our domestic economic situation. And it won't change the way that we have our international alliances. And so all of these good ideas, all of this thought, including in collaboration with private enterprise, has got to be turned into something that actually has the effect for us to be able to establish the position that we should be able to achieve. Amen. I completely agree. Right. Uh, over to Casey. Yes, very boringly. I'm, I'm going to completely agree with that too, actually. And I think, you know, the UK is, in, you know, brilliant position to make the most of the international alliances, the technology sector that we know is thriving here. And, to, you know, when I talk to my um, international colleagues from different countries and, and from the US, there's a great appetite for the UK to do more and to do it better and to really set that agenda globally. And so I think that opportunity is there for us to seize uh, together and, and we should do that. Brilliant, fantastic. And finally, to the minister, who I've been rather mean to. <laughs> That's, you know, having run in, uh, what now, four or five general elections, I'm, uh, I've, I've experienced a lot worse, believe, uh, bel believe you me, particularly in 2010 when I ran as a Conservative in Kilburn, so I've, I'm, I'm used to it. Um, look, so first of all, thank you to Policy Exchange for hosting this event. It's been, I think, really interesting and an extremely important topic. I think what we've pretty clearly established is that to create the conditions for success, there are a whole number of pieces that, of the jigsaw that need to be in place, all of which individually are necessary but not sufficient. We need to make sure all of those components are in place in the UK, and we need to work together, whether it's the venture capital community represented by James, whether it's um, leading tech businesses like Google, uh, and whether it's the government on issues like uh, regulation and cyber security and infrastructure. Uh, we've all got to work together to make sure the UK infrastru infrastructure and ecosystem is the best in the world for tech. I think we've got a fantastic starting position, but we need to work uh, relentlessly and restlessly to make sure that we uh, build on the phenomenal start that we've got. And if we do that, I have complete confidence and complete conviction that the UK will be the leading place to do business and to launch new tech businesses for decades and decades ahead. Fantastic. Well, thank you. It's been fantastic to hold this event uh, today. And it's also been fantastic to have a sort of first outing of a new minister and see such passion going into a new ministerial portfolio. One of the things I often hear about policy exchange is that we need to be having more of these conversations. These conversations are always taking place at policy exchange. We have a fantastic programme for the rest of conference, which if you haven't yet filled up your diaries, I suggest you do so. But in the meantime, I hope you'll join me in applause. What's well, been a fantastic panel um, and thank you everybody for everything they've done. Thank you very much.